Good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the BIC stream session on selective amnesia, a play on disappearance. Uh, today's BIC stream session is around veteran journalist Said Nakwi's book, A Muslim Vanishes, a play. And joining uh, Said Nakwi uh, in conversation, we have Akar Patel, a veteran columnist and activist. And a ring to tie them all, we have Dania Rajendran, uh, who is the editor of the and founder of the News Minute. Uh, as per our usual BIC stream sessions, the biodatas of the speakers will come in the chat box. And after you have heard the speakers, you could post your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, with this, over to you, Danya. Thank you uh, very much, Ravi. It's, it's indeed a pleasure and privilege to be here speaking to Mr. Saeed Nakwi and Mr. Akar Patel about the book, The Muslim Vanishes. Um, everyone watching, I suggest you should read the book. It's not a breezy read. In fact, it'll make you very uncomfortable. It'll make you unhappy also, I would say. Uh, it'll make you ask a lot of questions, not only about yourself, but about the people around you, about what they do, how they react to situations. It's currently not available in Bangalore, but we should ensure that it comes back to bookstores in Bangalore. That's, of course, the first thing to do. So the book, Muslim Vanishes, is a dystopian play in which one day Indians wake up and realize that all 200 million Muslims in the country have just vanished. So what happens next? Does India become a peaceful Hindu Maharashtra where everyone is coexisting happily? Because if one goes by what Hindu were leaders and their cronies, and even a section of the media tells us now, or rather the same thing in the play, the only trouble the country faces is, has been created by Muslims. But when the Muslim actually vanishes, India descends into further chaos. And what happens within this chaos? There's a jury which is put together. What does the jury decide? All these form the book. So I would like to ask Mr. Said Nakhi first. I'm sure you have been asked this the most, but definitely the most pertinent question. Why did you decide to write this book? Danya, as you know, that chanting a mantra repeatedly has a certain magical effect a mantra or a prayer or anything. But chanting facts repeatedly has the opposite effect. So I have this question that you've asked is always original. And as always, there is something that I have said before. And I have to be careful that I don't become an eternal boar who's got a script which he keeps saying, but I can't avoid it. There are certain, why did I write this book now? Because since 1982, now why 1982 is an important date for me, and I think it is an important date as uh, my coming book will, will, will indicate. The 1982 onwards, I have had a certain view of India, the idea of India. Uh, you and me and Akar and Ravi, all of us in India. And then how this kept changing and why it kept changing until it reached a point. And I, I was very polite about it. I wrote in several, a lot of books. I was extremely polite, but I found that I was not getting across. I was not being able to make my point because people have a, uh, they are determined. They sort of, they have locked their minds to certain data, certain facts, and they don't want to listen to them. Now, when that happened, there is, I will not bore you with my Urdu poets and all, but I shall, I shall cite one poet. A great man called Ghalib, he wrote a, a couplet which says, Laag ho to usko hum samjhe lagao. Laag ho to usko hum samjhe lagao. Jab na ho kuch bhi, 
तो धोखा खाएं क्या इफ आई वॉज एनी वे इन योर कॉस्मोस आई वुड फूल माई सेल्फ दट आई मैटर टू यू इफ आई वॉज एनी वे बट आई डिस्कवर्ड ओवर दीज इन्स दट आई नो वे देर then why am i fooling myself all these decades all these years so almost with a vengeance i said okay let us tell the truth that is why this book was it was a kind of exasperation with my inability with my sort of lucknow politeness not being able to come across so i had to i had to hammer the point in and if i succeeded i do not know you will tell me now ah uh, i mean you did succeed in making me think that am i surrounded by because the book when the muslim vanishes there is first a worry oh my god the muslim is vanished and then slowly not even slowly very quickly everybody just adjusting to that reality where the muslim is vanished and then they think what can i now do in this world where the muslim is no longer there and i take over their properties right so take over what they did so people adjust to that reality quite fast which was very unsettling for me while reading uh, why did you decide to also have this book set in the media the whole the chap- in fact the first chapter starts with the media the entire conversation is uh, are between journalists why did you decide to set the book uh, in the media well the, there are the layered answers to that one it's like an onion you see the i i blame the media for much of what is happening the media has has distorted the national picture the media is distorting globally and internally i mean oh, from ukraine to communalism the media distorts the picture and it has media has created this atmosphere of uh, what we call communalism in a certain way this hate of the demonization of muslims is a great deal a creation of our media that's why the media the other reason why the media was in fact selected by me as a means of a vehicle to communicate is because media has because i wanted various the polemics of it would be resolved by point counter point by you know like in music you have point and counter point like within or in classical indian music you have you have notes within a line so uh, that was one reason otherwise i could have written a straight narrative this is what i feel and you would have joined and gone well what is new in this so i thought that i would contrive it as a play make it into a uh, a drama which is being enacted by anchors in a studio and the play and the studio and, and if you see carry on the the uh, the character the 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 owner of the channel for the stops i mean he is worried how the hell is the other chap beating me and he says well sack them send them all to bombay then the fellow says but where will they live in bombay on the footpath that's my way of sacking them because under the law i can't sack them straight away so there the whole series of things which in fact i've been with the media and the media is part of me the actually let me uh but but you ask let let akar get into the uh, debate also before i carry on mr akar patel what did you think of the book and because you and i sit in bengaluru and most of the people who are listening to this right now are from karnataka when you read the book did you have this eerie feeling like i did that here in this state we are seeing this demand that uh, muslims should be removed from you know public and economic spaces though though it's a small minority which we feel are making this demand it's very much there did you have this eerie feeling while reading the book yeah i think it's it's a dystopia only in the sense that it's fictionalized 
there is no um, doubt about the fact that today in india the muslim has vanished from has has been made to vanish from many parts of the polity if you look this for the first time since 1947 we don't have a muslim a chief minister in india anywhere in india people might not know that uh, and and this is not a new thing that even before the dismissal of the government in kashmir um, no muslim chief minister has ever served out a five year term in any state in india except for a pondicherry it was not a state um until even two years was was the one who had the longest term if you look at our, our states in 15 states there is no muslim minister at all also we have a very successful political party that chooses to um deliberately enforce what what i call a electoral apartheid so you've got 303 lok sabha mps of whom none is a muslim uh, before that you had 282 lok sabha mps of whom none, none was a muslim the question is to what end are we doing this and the answer seems to be to no particular end other than to exclude to make them vanish and then based on this thinking we've got post 2019 a series of laws and policies which target muslim marriage and divorce which target muslims right to pray in government allotted spaces the right of muslim girls and women to wear what they want the right of muslim tradesmen to sell what they want on the street and this has happened very quickly but i think that it's happened extremely efficiently so while the book while said's book fictionalizes it and takes it to an extreme the book reflects a reality which unless you are totally blind uh, exists and is deepening and unless you are not empathetic at all um you will have felt that this is a book written out of desperation it is a book that is a that is as a said said uh, the the speaking of facts no longer matters at the moment um within india uh, i don't know whether i would blame the media for it but within india it appears to be the case that this is settled that we are going to treat muslims in this particular way as we have done over the last 40 months and this will not change a book written out of desperation would you agree with that uh, uh, with that su- summary which uh, mr patel gave well uh, there is uh, he is right in some ways he is right but i think we are still missing the target we are still not asking the question a the profit of this communalism b why did it start and when did it start and i will offer you you know the other day i was watching a program on ndtv and i think this anchor called barwa i forget the full name now she had a series of dalit atrocities the first scene is that in raibareli where in fact very close to where my uh, what we call native villages Uh, very near raibareli in raibareli these upper caste boys have cornered a low caste boy and one of them has ordered him to lick his 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 feet and there's a long sequence that that boy has been made to bow down and he's licking his leg his feet then he it seen cuts it is at a temple where somebody probably tried to enter a temple where he should not have he there's a, a circle has been made with chalk on that particular spot he has been made to rub his nose it's there on you take a look at this program on tv nd tv about a month ago i will give you the details also dates also this goes on for for what i in real life it went on for hours but here this is shown next a bride groom on a horseback is entering a village the villagers stop him you can't a low caste person is not supposed to come be a bride groom come riding on a charger you can't come riding on a horse so he is blocked he is thrashed in front of his bride to be there are other instances where the legs of the horse are chopped off 
you can't do this. This is not your station. Then you all have heard that the case of the Hathras, the girl is raped. She, her body is hung up. They say that she committed suicide. If she committed suicide, then in the middle of the night, without the parents or the family being informed, the police cremate her. Now, this goes on and on and on and on. Our attention does not dwell on it too long. Our attention is on the fact on the lynching, bulldozing, which is much more spectacular these days, lynching, uh, naqab, uh, where the police stands by and the girl is harassed, you saw in your own state. I'm surprised. The Karnataka has been something of a shock to me because I always found that to be a very elegant and a very tolerant uh, state. Maybe I was mistaken because of Bangalore and and maybe the coastal on the coastal uh, belt is a slightly different thing. Uh, I have I have adored uh, Karnataka. I mean, Hubli Darbar. I used to go there to meet. You'd be surprised. Um, uh, Malik Arjun Mansoor, the great musician, Gangubai Handal. They used to live in Hubli Darbar up there, and I visited them, and they were the very happy to me of what we call uh, cultural commerce. You know, that which according to me has sustained India. And that is why these stories, now, I have a feeling that if this repetition on television was not done, the story would not become so big. However, but why is it done? In a panchayat election, there are 25 Muslims in an area and 75 Muslim Hindus, rather than make the broadening of the road an issue or the building of the bridge an issue or grain an issue or food grains an issue, you say the simplest thing is, is sectarian divide. As uh, Yogi Adityanath said, it's 80-20, 25-70. Let us consolidate the 75 against those 20. And, and we've got a simple, we have to do nothing, no economic reforms, no road building, nothing. We just divide them and we've got power. We come into Satta. That is at the level level, smaller level. It carries on. They are, it's a, like a concentric circle. In a national level, as I've said repeatedly, this lynching, beef lynching, uh, hijab, uh, ghar wapsi, being even being reconverted when there is no conversion in Hinduism. How do you reconvert? But they are being brought home. This uh, business of no meat during Navaratra in North India. All of this is, it keeps the temperature high. It keeps the temperature saffronized. But it does not bring about the big changes. The big change comes about when this communalism is tied to nationalism. What do I mean when this communalism is tied to Balakot? When Balakot happens, when we go and attack Pakistan, then we win the 2019 elections with a thumping majority. That is what happens. And this is the... Now, what have I said? I said, you, you, we are all guilty of ignoring casteism is an ancient social habit. We don't want to look at it. It is like a, a bad family secret, which we keep. We do not want to examine it because a, it's a family secret. There's an expression in Urdu, ghar ki baat hai, ghar mein do. Let it remain there. Don't, don't talk about it. We know, but it is, there's nothing you can do about it. Communalism is a political project. You and Akar and I have never had a relationship of hate. It has not been so. This 
let me uh, add a little more to this. You see, Muslims, when Narendra Modi became Prime Minister in 2014, I promise you I have no business to politicize the whole thing. I'm simply giving you a data. When he became Prime Minister in 2014, his very first speech in Parliament, and I have to repeat it because people, it has not registered with people. His very first speech, he said, Bara saw salki hulami se aminical nai. Hulami actually translated means slavery. What he meant was subjugation. 1200 years of subjugation. We have to get out of it. Now, so far, the etiquette, the political etiquette was whatever you feel inside, Danya, you and your parents and grandparents may feel that we've got to get rid of this Muslim in our system. That may, be, that may have been there. But the etiquette was that we talked, you and I have together driven the British out after 200 years of foreign occupation. This was the culture of the national movement. Now something else, that a quantum leap here. 200 years, no. 1200 years, in other words, the entire Muslim period, and even there, I might add by way of parenthesis, a, the, it is not 1200 years. It is actually 1,393 years. Why? Because the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, died in the year 632. Work out on your computer. 632. But in 629, while he was alive, a mosque had been built by a Hindu landlord in Cochin, Sherum and Perumal Mosque. Why did he build it? Because suddenly he found there was trade between the Arabian Peninsula and the Kerala coast for centuries and for many, many millennia before Islam. And therefore, these people have uh, have got a new religion. When they come here for their trade, they need a place for worship. This Hindu landlord built a mosque. Now, had there been, had there been electoral politics in those days, the Hindu businessman would have said, look, this fellow is pampering the Muslims and ah, we are going to go out of business. Now he says, and Muslims are in a minority. Let us polarize and let us get going. So, this went on, but you know what happened? In again, I I feel uh, I feel something like as if I'm being a bore because I've been saying this too often. No one seems to realize that Abdul Rahim Khan Khana, who was Akbar's general and a great poet of Avadi, of course, he was the. There is no poet that I know who has written poetry in praise of Lord Rama in Sanskrit. People don't know that. And what poetry? What is the, what is the sentiment? He says, O oh Lord, you touch that stone, it becomes a helia. O oh Lord, you made an army out of the animal kingdom, the Vanar Sena. A chandal has been made humanized by you. When? Will you turn your benign eye on me, O oh Lord? Who is saying this? Abdul Rahim Khan Khana, five times a day, namaz saying, Muslim, general, poet, and a multiple. He was a genius of many sorts. Recently, in our day, Nehru's friend, um, founder of the Communist Party, the early member of the Congress, uh, Maulana Hasrat Mohani, great poet. He was a member of the Constituent Assembly. He never signed the Constitution. That's another story because he thought it was not good enough for the people. Now this man, his poetry, his songs on his adoration for Krishna are unknown. They should, rather the, the same media, if it had a little more sense, it would have amplified this. There, 
it carries on and on. Ghalib, I mentioned. He goes to Varanasi and he sets, uh, he puts down anchor there and he writes his longest poem, Charahe there, which means the lamp in the temple. And he calls, he calls uh, Varanasi the Kaaba of Hindustan. This repeated and modern Asia, the, the most famous bhajan in the last 60 years, most famous bhajan in North India. They may be different there. In North India, Man Tarpat Hari Darsan Ko Aaj, Lord you know, Rag Malkos, writer um, is, um, uh, is a Muslim, uh, singer Muhammad Rafi, music, uh, the music director Naushad, all three of them created this, and it carries on. Just the other day, um, uh, ask uh, Said Mirza uh, Akar says as in town, he is full of all this. He himself exemplifies this. So the fact of the matter is that ignorance, ignorance has been generated. And this ignorance is being made the staple of our cultural lives. And that which joined you and me has been set aside. And that which can be, they want to excavate on the fault lines. And the fault lines are, some of them are invented. It didn't happen. You know, like for instance, there are many stories of uh, atrocities of, of Muslims. They didn't ever happen. There's no historical proof. But, uh, and mind you, the BJP is not the only, only culprit. There is something wrong from the very beginning. I'll say, give you one detail and then I shall shut up. The UNESCO came to Delhi and said, look, China has got so many um, uh, heritage cities. You have none. Why don't you allow us to adopt some cities? There are seven cities of Delhi. And oh, the Congress leadership, cultural elite fell into deep thought. They said, my God, how can, because all seven cities happen to be six are Muslim and one is Latians Delhi, which is Angres, which is British. Now, we can't have uh, seven cities being excavated by, uh, discovered by UNESCO as, uh, so the big, deep contemplation. They said, okay, let us settle for two. Shah Jahanabad, which is uh, Red Fort, where the Prime Minister makes his speech, and Latians Delhi. So we'll, we'll work on these two. My good friend Chappi Mishra and others, all Hindus, by the way, they collected a massive documents on, and now the UNESCO was about to come. And here was this document about to be presented. In came a mysterious hand from the Prime Minister's office. That document was whisked away. So we are the capital city of this country is one where the leadership is not proud of the monuments that exist in it. You know, it's a, it's a tragedy. It really is a tragedy that the capital city of the country is littered with monuments and yet the leadership which has come into being, and it is not only this, the, it was the Congress government which refused to uh, have uh, uh, Shah Jahanabad and Latyans uh, as, uh, as uh, heritage cities. So this is, it's an amazing problem. Just now there, there's an issue of a hundred villages, villages with names like Mohammedpur, Hashimpura, all of these should be named. And it's going on. The Municipal Corporation of Delhi is busy doing it. And where is Akar? Where are you? You're also, no, yes, where are you, Danya? Where are your counterparts here? They are, they say, oh, it's terrible. The liberal Hindu 
is sympathetic. He's sympathetic to my, the fact that I'm being tortured. But over a period of time, this habitual and instinctive sympathy turns to guilt. And when it turns to guilt over a period of time, you begin to find excuses for on the other side because you don't want to live with guilt. After all, you and you, your lives are there. You are not affected. My children collect around me and say, hey, listen, have you seen that they have gone and, and, and destroyed that monument? Have you seen the two boys have been taken into jail without any, and they're there for? So in my family, they're different. I, if you were not there, India would not be there. But there's a difference. And this difference has to be, has again to be uh, explained. If Bain, that's just one, one point and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll go away. Because the question will not arise otherwise, the, the, what I'm about to say. What happens is that the Muslim in India lives among Hindus. In my day to night, I am, I am interacting only with Hindus, only. The Hindu in India has no Muslim in his experience. Think about it. Think about it. In the course of the day, of the week, of the month, there is no Muslim in your living experience. I live. There is, what that happen, What does that do? That creates an apartheid of the mind in your mind. Why? Because you have you no know, experience of me. You have no experience of them. So when in Ramadan I say, "Hey, listen, you must go to Jama Masjid. It is spectacular. It is beautiful. It is peaceful. The most liberal of my friends." Have I've not been able to persuade. Why? Because in their mind, the ogre, oh, so many Muslims there. You'd be amazed. Once I took Meghna Desai, it was uh, Swami Agnivesh. Swami Agnivesh and Lord Desai, we, we, I took them to Jama Masjid, crack of dawn, that's called Sahiri. But in Ramadan, once you have that meal in the morning, I said, you will never experience it. Come with me. They came. And Swamiji said, well, what about my food? I had anticipated that. And I had taken a different carrier of vegetarian food, which Kareem restaurant, very gracefully, very graciously, they, they served him. So, but people don't go there. There is a, this apartheid of the mind. That is where ogres are born. I've spoken too much and it's yours. The apartheid of the mind. Uh, Mr. Arthur Patel, one premise of the book is that the Muslim is made the villain by political parties, by uh, Hindutva groups, and by many people in India, primarily because they are easy targets. But the real problem could have been between the oppressor caste and the oppressed caste in India. So when the Muslim vanishes, the next layer of problem starts between the oppressor and the oppressed caste. What do you think of that premise in the book and, of course, the reality in the country? Well, the, the, the book is quite clear in the sense that uh, Saeed's got these two uh, pyramids and he says that if one falls, which is the Muslim Kashmir uh, problem with uh, Pakistan being the yeah, yeah. part of the pyramid, then the thanks. caste one... Uh, thanks, uh, uh, thanks, Akhar. I will, hey, you give me the chance, I'll explain it to you. Once I don't want to butt in now. So that's so far as the book is concerned, the reality is, I think, not quite uh, the same. I think the state in India has sought to make its peace with the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes. So on the side of law, you've got the state reaching out to them in terms of reservations, both in jobs and in uh, political representation through reserved seats. With, so uh, uh, that does not mean that uh, there is no oppression, of course, that the, the society and the cultural reality of this uh, nation is that the Dalits and the Adivasis are at 
uh, the receiving end of both state and uh, society, and that uh, continues to be the case. However, I would say that in the case of the Muslims, there is a deliberate top-down from the state, legislative and political and policy-based uh, attack, especially post-2019, uh, which has been legitimized. So while the state has tried and failed to be able to make good to the promise it held out in the constitution to the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes, the state in India is moving, has departed from its secular and pluralist moorings and is deliberately going after Muslims. So I would say that that's one part to it. Second, I think that the evidence that the BJP and the Sangh are um, targeting the Muslims because of the flaws within Hindu society as, as a distraction, I don't know if that's true. And I would, I would submit that uh, however half-baked they might be, they've been quite successful in attracting to their side a lot of the Dalits and a lot of the Adivasis, uh, including uh, organized groups. And there is an attempt to be able to broad base the leadership of the BJP. Including the Prime Minister himself. He, he comes from the... Well, he's had, to, he's had to sort of give up the, the habit, the, the cultural habits of his community to be, to be sort of acceptable within that space, I think. But uh, they have tried. Um, so I don't necessarily know if uh, the argument that which is which is made uh, quite often that the Muslim is targeted purely because of the the uh, divisions within Hindu society, which become impossible to paper over if uh, without the Muslim as the primary enemy. I don't know if that argument has been fully thought through. But as I'm, an only uh, argument, it is flawed. If that is the only argument, then it yes, is flawed. Yes. But I'll explain that. I I would say that. Uh, what what we are seeing is not a distraction. So this is what what, what has happened to India post 2019 is not towards any specific political end, and I don't think it is towards any kind of distraction. I think it is being done deliberately, um, and it is a means and an end. There is no particular end that the Hindu Rashtra has legislatively, um, other than what what we are seeing now, which is targeted legislation aimed at minorities, constant. Of harassment uh, through law and policy and the bringing along of society with it. I think that the most successful part of what the BJP and the Prime Minister have done is that they have normalized what we are seeing around us, that there is not enough resistance uh, from uh, uh, society at large and, and from the media. And the opposition, to my mind, has for the most part run away because it believes, perhaps rightly, that what the BJP is doing is electorally so successful that to go against it would be damaging. How would you like to explain uh, that premise? Because, okay, that's not the only distraction or the reason why, but the book does deal a lot with that topic that otherwise there would have been a lot of problems between the oppressed and the oppressor caste in India. And when the Muslim is removed from that equation, it becomes one against the other. The book does deal with that topic quite a bit. Um, is that for me? Mr. Sayed Nam, uh, you want to explain want, the premise? You, is it for me? Yes, yes. For me. Okay. Let me first address what uh, Akar is right. There is a great deal of effort. In fact, this effort in political terms goes back. For instance, I'll tell you, in UP, the Congress Party and in fact the entire polity was very Brahmin dominated, uh, which is slightly different from Bihar. Bihar it, and, and other states. UP was a very, it was a pure caste pyramid. Pandit Govind Vallapant, and after which Kamlapati Tripathi, after which Hemvati Nandan Bahugana, uh, Bindeshwari Dube, after which you had uh, Narayan Dattiwari. So there are a whole series of uh, um, uh, Brahmins. That when after a, a whole uh, churning, that churning should be explained. I'll, I'll remind me that I have to come. I'm breaking away from this point. I will return to it. What was the churning? The churning was 
that in 1989, V.P. Singh, Vishwanath Pratap Singh, the only Thakur chief minister of UP, by the way, by that time, later on another became, he did something for his own political ends. Namely, he pulled out the Mandal Commission report and gave 27% of reservation to the OBC, the other backward caste, namely the uh, Yadavs and uh, Kurmis and so on. Now, this set the cat among the pigeons again. Here, this fellow is breaking up Hindu society for his own political ends. And for that Mandal Commission report, you had the Kamandal, namely, you had L.K. Advani's Rath Yatra. So you, what happened was that the caste and communalism, caste was used by one, and the only way to neutralize this caste politics was to go very high shrill on, on uh, decibel on the communal politics. So Ram was invented. Ram uh, agitation started. And ultimately, Babri Masjid was targeted. So that became the competition. It was a car. At that time, when BJP came to power, to come back to Akar's uh, point, which is right, they, in a state which has been Brahmin dominated, when they realized that they have to bring a chief minister, they got hold of Kalyan Singh. Now, Kalyan Singh happens to be an other backward caste loathe. Now, what does this do? All the Brahmins who had hitherto, they thought that the BJP is coming, they'll go there. But when they found that it is uh, a loathe, they, they were all confused. Where should we go? So, this problem, they have been sensitive to the issue of caste in the Hindu hierarchy. What it, in political terms, I've given you one example. But in social terms, what it does is that when this fellow who has been the foot soldier and who, foot, who takes his, out his sword and he is given status, with this status, he goes back to his village. There, he is taught a lesson. You think you've come up in life? No, you will never come up in life. And his legs are broken. So therefore, this little temporary upward mobility that has been artificially injected in him is taken out. Caste is an ancient cultural habit. Communalism is a political project. This reality remains. And we will have to grapple. If you will permit me, uh, I will show you these, these two triangles of mine. Danya, Akar has seen a little bit of this in a, on another occasion, but you have not. This is the caste triangle. It's very simple. The Brahman, Kshatriya, Shudra, etc., etc. Said Nakhvi is not here. He is a Malaycha. He is outside. He is outside this. He is a Malaych. And now, as you go down, it becomes wider and wider and wider. Now, if this has been exposed to Western notions of democracy, upward mobility, social justice, so this is Kiri. This is Kiri. And some politicians up here get an idea and they say, well, now let us mobilize this against them. Then comes the other triangle. Here. Hindu, Muslim. Srinagar, Delhi. India, Pakistan. India, Pakistan. Delhi, 
Srinagar, Muslim, Hindu. This is one complex of issues. One complex. You touch any one line of this triangle, it's a principle of geometry, and all other lines and angles are affected. Now, what you need to do is, what I have done in the play is I have taken out this and I have left you with this to sort out. I have removed this altogether and I have left you with this to sort out. What happens is that Yogi Adityanath openly says the game is very simple in UP elections recently. It's 8020. It's 8020. Now, with this out of the equation, what is the mathematics now? It is 8020. It's 8020. So these people, this lot, will want to topple the structure like this, which, which this lot will never allow. So they will keep this on boil. This will always be on boil because, remember now, Akar, Danya, the question then arises, is there no salvation? As the Satar's old play, no exit. We can't get out of this trap. Yes, we can. And the trap is here. This. You remove this line, then Balakot has no meaning. This nationalism tied to communalism has no meaning. Hindu, but the minute you do that, a project of Hindu consolidation is hit for a six. This collapses, this line collapses on this. This line collapses on this line. It all gradually, theoretically disappears. And take it from me, the day India and Pakistan, the day this is settled, this game will lose its, it, it is simply not possible. Have you understood this? Have I made myself clear that this has to be kept on boil to manage? No, the triangle is explained in the book also. There is a mention of the triangle in the book. I'm simply giving you a graph to yes. lead you into the soul of the book. The problem yes. that I have posed. There are many things in that book. You see, hmm. it, this is not the only thing. But hmm. here, I have left you with this. Minus communalism, now you sort this out. How would you? How would you sort this out with the present uh, electoral system, the Westminster model? How would you sort this one out? You follow? That is uh, the essence. The problem is Pakistan. And mind you, Recently, uh, there's something has happened, and I'm I'm among the optimists on that issue because uh, now why pa why is Pakistan so important? I mean, we created a country that we we create a country and we proceed to hate it in perpetuity. I mean, look at it. Is there any logic in it? Is there any logic that we created it and we have? proceeded to hate it in perpetuity because we want to manage our own internal contradictions so that you and I are never at peace. We are discussing this when this country, which is uh, where there's so much of sculpture, there is so much of architecture, there is so much of um, music, there is so much of literature in so many languages. There's, my God, there is the, this, uh, the, the side. I wrote a piece once upon a time. I called it the three S matrix. I said the three things that unite uh, India. Of course, I was taken to task by that. S, sari, 
Sangeet, Sanskrit. Now, this, I said, these are three things that uh, are common from uh, Kanyakumari to, uh, uh, to the north, except in Kashmir, they don't wear saris, but the Pandits do, women do. And uh, here, the, so they said, oh, Said, you and your Sanskrit thing. There's many things I have said in my life, Akar and Danya, which I have been taken to task for. Among them is this. When we partitioned India, that is where the problem lies. When we partitioned India, you see, you have so far said that you are opposed to a two-nation theory. Fair enough. Which what is the two-nation theory? That Hindus and Muslims form two nations. Agreed. Of course, suddenly one morning, 3rd of June 1947, you turn, half turn. You accept one half of that proposition that a, a Muslim country is created there, but we are opposed to two-nation theory. So this, this sort of trick has boomeranged on us. Why did we do it? We did it, according to me. What should we did it? Because Pandit Nehru was hell-bent on keeping Kashmir. Uh, Sardar Patel and Moral Sebai, on contiguity principle, let them take the valley. He was for it. Panditji said, no, that's what we have to fight for. So if you have to fight for the valley, then secularism has to be introduced. I mean, there was a purpose why secularism was introduced. It was not. It is not secularism as in secular society elsewhere. Here, there was a direct purpose. If we are not secular, then how do we keep Kashmir, which is contiguous with Muslim Pakistan, when that is the basis on which the nations are being divided? The other thing, of course, was that Nehru's elite, his oisius group, they thought Hindus were the, were the, some kind of a lower middle class, uh, Mufassal entity. You know, they, they were the, this was a different elite uh, uh, around Nehru, which is completely different. <clears throat> now, so what should have been the answer, Nakhvi Simple, if you had decided, if that became Pakistan, we became Hindustan. That should have been the straightforward uh, to me. It seems so simple and elementary. Then what would happen to you, Nakhvi Nothing would happen to me. Yeah. Britain, England, is a Anglican monarchy. And who is the mayor of London? Sadiq Khan. And who, if Boris Johnson collapses, it goes, who might be the, the, the prime minister? Your emphasis son-in-law. He might be. So, therefore, in other words, you can have the, the nature of the state. It was, you can have a secular society and a state where the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, anoints the queen or the king. So therefore, according to me, but then I am in a minority. According to me, there was no problem. This was the trick. This was the trick which has got us into trouble. Uh I, I just move, I just move Akar, I apologize, I talk too much. So I have to do. move to another question. Um, yes. Both of you can answer. It's not exactly from the book, uh, but it all it, it also the book also deals with it. My doubt is when we speak about um, uh, communalism, Islamophobia, etc., do we also deal too much in binaries? For the for example, the book also deals with Hindu and Muslim, right? Do we deal too much in binaries? Uh, uh, Muslims, Shias are separate from Sunnis, their political beliefs are different. Uh, for example, I cover South India a lot. I see Syrian Christians in Kerala behaving very, very differently uh, from everyone else. In fact, some of the Syrian Christian leaders are at the forefront spreading Islamophobia. I'm sorry for all the noise. I have too many pets and they're all in the room. Uh, so I want to ask whether we look at uh, 
uh, from we i mean the media also whether we continue to look at things in binaries and that's the problem aka uh, i would say in this instance no that that there is a primary agent in this which is the state and by state i mean the entire edifice of government which at the union is controlled by one party and i think that what we are referring to what what this discussion is about is about what is being done in society by the state uh to my mind while it's obviously true that we are highly fragmented uh Uh, as a society by geography by language by faith within faith uh by schisms and so on the problem at the moment that we are facing to my mind is what is being done to the country through the state and the state is in the control of one party which professes to have a specific ideology i don't agree with said when he says that had we renamed ourselves or named ourselves hindustan this problem might have been lessened because it's it's not a problem of nomenclature this is a problem of exclusion what do you do what is the meaning of the hindu state it is that no muslim should hold office exactly the same as what the islamic state in pakistan means that by law no non muslim can become the prime minister or the president we have done through uh through um to a cunningness what they have done through law there is no there is no chance for a muslim to become the prime minister of india but but we don't need a law for that the meaning of hindu rashtra is not to be found in changes in the constitution it is to be found entirely in what kind of bullying can we think of today to brutalize this minority that's it there is nothing else it's shallow it's small it's petty but that's all it is that is why if you look at the texts the primary texts of of the prss and the bjp and of sort of hindutva generally speaking there is no notion of there is no description there is no explanation for what hindu rashtra actually means it is only this they can't keep this they can't keep that we won't let them do this we won't let them do that even had we been a hindu state in nomenclature this would not have changed uh, so to return to to the question i don't think that this is this can be seen in fragmented terms this is a binary and it, the problem is that the state is uh, pushing this this is a problem that's coming to us top down um and which is why it cannot be resolved in trying to um, point out the ecumenical nature of this country or list out all the schisms that we have within our faiths uh, the problem uh, can be solved only by making sure that the state stops doing what it's doing so you i just want to ask one more question to you uh, before i go to the question or post by uh, people who are listening in you have spoken about the stop down approach in your book the price of the modi years also and you just mentioned it but my question is the stop down has continued the stop down attitude has continued for some time now and have they been successful in sort of confusing the general public because see for example the hijab issue in karnataka what i felt is that uh, if even for the most liberal hindu there is a definition of a bad muslim and a good muslim that in their minds they see someone uh, like okay uh, a muslim who does not wear a religious symbol for example why should they wear the hijab why can't they just wear the uniform and go these questions have has the top down approach for a long time and all the other things that happened along with it left a lot of people confused in fact they don't even understand simple things like it's constitutional that they can uh, wear what they want they can fight for their rights these things so do you think that even in the most liberal minds there is no, the one voice difference. is breaking a bit the voice is breaking a bit okay yeah, but if you got the question can you answer it uh the uh, just just give it in sankshep in a in brief Said that I was the start of the last minute. Sorry, that was for me. It was for Mr. Uh, Akar Patel. I'll come to you after this because there are three or four questions to you from the audience uh, also. No, I, I think that in any primitive society, this is natural that there is very little empathy, and in fact, there is satisfaction to see the bullying of somebody who's seen as the other. I'm not surprised. The thing is that we should recognize that for decades this country has tried from the union and through the state governments to try and 
at least reconcile some of the problems we have that this is not a, this is not a society that is idyllic there are problems in it when the state acts as a catalyst and aggravates those those problems and continuously keeps them on the boil that is that is what we are facing now uh, i don't think that people are confused there is no there is there is absolutely no reason for anybody to be confused over how uh, muslims are being treated in terms of their religious cultural socio economic or political practices they they have been marginalized and they are deliberately being pushed to the margins daily uh, for somebody like me as a hindu to not recognize that or to or to sort of you know pretend that there are two sides to this is quite shameful but i think it's also a reality that you are, we don't akar akar it is not muslim per se it is a combination kashmiri problem pakistan problem muslim unless you tie them all together hatred doesn't get the cauldron doesn't boil over that cauldron has got to be there is no innate hindu hatred for muslim it I is a manufacture and in that manufacture all these ingredients are required that my, is my, my view there is that the bjp would be quite willing to make peace with pakistan so long as it it is allowed to continue what it does within uh, india and in fact that has been their strategy that and being a hindu interacting with hindus i don't know uh, i don't think i agree that there is no hatred among hindus for the muslims if you remove the pakistan equation also i think there are a lot of people who are happy to hate uh, would you agree with me aka i would and i think that th- there is the, the how much pushback do we see from the media on what is going on In, not only do we not see any pushback we are seeing people happy and willing and enthusiastic about wanting to mount the bulldozer and run over people's homes and shops this is not normal and to expect that this is happening either because of a lack of information or because of confusion i think is wrong this is happening because this is the way society has been oriented deliberately uh, with the state acting as a very serious catalyst there is another Uh, there is just one more thing akar you're right the another dimension i would like to introduce here is that you i thought were luckier than me and i think you still are lucky being in bangalore i don't see i mean i the problem i do not superimpose the problems of the cow belt on the rest of india i have been this debate supposing you were to sustain this debate in tiruvanthapuram it would not carry it would not it would not reverberate you try sustaining this in ramnathapuram no it would not it would not carry you try sustaining the so therefore a cow belt flaw is we tend to superimpose the reason why the tragedy is that is why the hindu rashtra is impossible because your currency notes are in 17 different languages we are a multi ethnic multicultural multilingual society and this uniformity which is being thought about is perpetual struggle which we will face in the northern belt man in a cochin will not i was in kozhi court just now where i had great food by the way Muslim is there. Powerful newspaper called Madhyam. No, no problem. A little bit. Now they are creating some jagra between Christians and Muslims in some parts of Kerala. So therefore, the problem is not universally India's. Problem is a portion. The what the British used to call call cow belt and what we should call the Hindi belt. No, I think that even applies to Karnataka. For example, I see a lot of people say that is why Karnataka, Karnataka the new Uttar Pradesh puzzles me. Karnataka puzzles me. No, no, I mean a lot of people say it's Karnataka the new Uttar Pradesh. I personally don't agree with it because Karnataka does not behave uniformly. Coastal Karnataka behaves separately. Northern Karnataka separately. Mysore Mandya in a different way. Anyway, so I am going to ask you one of the questions which has been put forward by people who are listening. So much, Joshi is asking, Mr. Nakvi. how do we create incentives for politicians to sort the india pakistan issue because this issue as you said is used by politicians on both sides for the domestic politics how do we create incentives for politicians to sort out the india pakistan issue 
sometimes danya uh, a political event changes geography let me give you an example for years when pakistan came into being our diplomacy consisted in neutralizing pakistan everywhere we were obsessed with that throughout then in 1971 something strange happened we halved pakistan we created bangladesh and you know the geography changed we became a large country surrounded by small countries who began to play balance of power each one of these small countries began to flourish a china card the person who understood this very well and uh, who i regard as one of the uh, visionaries uh, whom i knew as prime minister that was vashpai he immediately understood this and he said we have to go to china and mend with them so that that is the source that is the card that all these people are flourishing is if we become friends then this card becomes useless you see that was his idea likewise in pakistan to give you the example that if you have a tennis racket like this here you have iran iran oh my god my friend has produced some a tennis racket for me here you are here you are uh this is the guts of the racket this is where the americans were this is afghanistan right here this is where the americans were in august they upped and left and suddenly what happened on this rim you had iran uzbekistan turkmenistan kazakhstan pakistan china russia and india somewhere here at the stem now are we going to continue this fellow has gone there across the seven seas we had no option but to make peace over here and if you realize this on this ukraine issue there's a great deal of getting away we are not following the 100% uh, american line altogether it has changed because geography here has changed and there was hope just when there was hope in this ge- this geography a certain changes the politics is a dynamic thing certain changes took place for instance in pakistan americans are trying to make a comeback they tried through kazakhstan where they the uh, thing failed then the regime change just in january a uh, regime change effort in kazakhstan failed and then they now they are they are entering through the ouster of a prime minister bringing people who are there and whom they know along with the army etc etc so this is a perpetual jhagda but unless this is sorted out this is sorted out if it is not sorted out we will be bashed up more and more until 2024 when these elections take place after that let us see what happens but this will happen in the cow belt please take care of karnataka it's a wonderful state i do not i don't understand karnataka the whole texture of it misses me somehow but the rest of the south no east no northeast no this is where the problem is so all of you say prayers that i will watch people being bashed up until 2024 because that is when the elections take place and until because uh, unless you sort out of pakistan you sort out pakistan the whole politics mellows that is the kashmir pakistan and indian muslims that is the uh, that is the cauldron i i will move on to answer we have three or four questions so i won't take those mr arthur patel if you can answer what pramod biligiri asks he says mr said naqvi mentioned that the average hindu person 
does not encounter any Muslim in their daily life and possibly Christians also. Do you believe anyone makes efforts to get more people from these communities to meet each other and socialize and understand each other? This was the I think that's a very... Was... Sorry, uh, Akar. This was the theory that uh, was formed after the violence in Bombay where you had the Mohalla committees. And the assumption was that you that 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 the other was completely alien to you, and then sort of if you met them in a fraternal setting, things would improve. I don't know if it's true that most Hindus don't encounter Muslims. I think with the 14% population and the Muslims of the subcontinent and of India, and I think this is a good thing. They are they are demonstrative of their faith. So you can see the places of their worship. They are they are they are they have congregational prayer. They wear their they often wear their identity on their person, and I think that's a good thing. And I don't know, given the fact, Sayyid has an interesting uh, line, a sort of throwaway line in his book, where he says that in Dehat, in the in 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 uh, rural India, the Muslims are to a large extent economically independent because they are in the trades, and I think that it, it, this is true. And I, I, I thought about that line. And I think it's because of this fact that they are in their trades that you can't actually avoid them. They, they, they wend, they drive, um, they, they don't uh, try to um, uh, you know, deliberately stay out of the economy. They, they want to participate in it. Um, so I don't know whether purely adding fraternity of externally imposed changes this. For many of us in the middle class who hate Muslims now, we went to schools which were where we were taught by uh, Christians. Uh, for us, many Hindus think it is good and right that a propagation be uh, criminalized, though it's a, a fundamental right. And there is no problem with barging into churches and stopping prayer and, and you know uh, stopping mass. So I don't know, I haven't thought this through fully, but I don't know if purely externally imposed of fraternal relations will change this, nor do I know, I think it's not true, that for the most part, Hindus generally are not in social contact with the Muslims. Uh, Mr. Nakhvi, there's a question from Amu Joseph, uh, who's a senior journalist from Bengaluru. She is asking, does, don't the RSS and the idea of Hindu Rashtra predate partition and Pakistan? This, of course, is vis-a-vis -vis your theory that if you remove Pakistan from the equation and if things are sorted with uh, Pakistan, the, the entire politics will mellow down. So her question is, didn't the idea of Hindu Rashtra predate all this? The idea of Hindu Rashtra, for it to grow, it needs the other. And the other is the Muslim. And the Muslim, along with Kashmir and Pakistan, is, because, is amplified into a huge big ogre. You follow, and that is what the Hindu society is pitted against. They, th that they imagine will bring about Hindu consolidation unless you have this, the othering, unless you have the enemy image, it will not happen. And so, yes, you're right. There is something in fact, we were at the same meeting where uh, Arun Shori said something uh, which has stayed with me. He said, look, we talk about all this, but in two years' time, it will be a hundred years of the RSS. Have you been reading their documents? Because why I've started reading some of them. He says, they are doing exactly what they had set out to do. You simply didn't know. You didn't do the basic homework that this is what they wanted, and they're doing it. My problem, of course, is my, I pose the other way, that it is not possible to impose uniformity on a country where every currency note has every denomination indicated in 17 languages, where we are multi-ethnic, we are multicultural, we are multilingual, and we can't talk to each other. You know, you talk, my friend Enram, I remember one day I lapsed into Hindi. He said, please speak a civilized language. So in other words, English was the only thing he understood other than Tamil, you see. So it's a very complex thing. 
and they think the Hindi, somehow Hindi nationalism will prevail. How will it prevail? Tamil Nadu really uh, nearly broke off in 1967 when they tried it. Tried it anywhere else. No, it won't. So, the one point I want to clarify, I when I say Hindustan, I didn't say Hindu. Rashi. You see, there were people in India, when you have given them a Muslim state, you call this the Hindu, the Hindu Hindu in India felt cheated. That he had been given this lollipop of secularism while the leadership had gone and given them a Muslim state. If it were a Hindustan, I would have had an easy bargain with Akka, with Danya, with Ravi. I would have had a bargain. Look, now you are, you want to, you are in the chariot. You want to ride the chariot. Yes, fair enough. But this is what I am 14%. Give me this in the police, this much in the army, this one in the civil service. I would have been able to strike a more honest bargain with you. And that I gave you the example in England today. This uh, the the chappy the, the uh, Sunik, what's his name exactly? Um, Infosys son in law, name name him. Who is the Rishi. chancellor Rishi. of the huh? Rishi. Rishi, there you are. If Boris Johnson goes, he's in line to become the prime minister of England. So therefore, you had the church is the overarching body. It is an Anglican monarchy, but a secular society. That would have been possible in India. That is my argument. By this, if we had uh, other, otherwise, why did you suddenly, you told us you'll never partition, then suddenly one morning you partition. That itself is a story that has not been done. And that is for our car to investigate and your next book. There are two more questions I'm going to combine and ask because both are talking about uh, the othering of Muslims. One is from Suparna and the other one is from Padmini. So I will go to Akar Patel first. Uh, the, combine the questions with everyone buying into soft Hindutva and politics. How does this, this virus of the other go away? The thought of the other go away? And there's a the Padmini asks, is not the demonizing and exclusion of Muslims similar to Nazism? Authoritarian regimes need a devil to galvanize public opinion. So I think it will not go away. Uh, and I think that it will, in fact, escalate. What the BJP has done is to devolve the uh, authority of the state to the mob. So the government of Haryana gave those migrant Muslims the right to congregational prayer on Friday. The mobs went weekly and they made sure that the government backed off. It is the mobs that have gathered outside schools and colleges trying to harass girls wearing uh, hijab. It's the mobs that have kicked off the eggs and the meat stalls from the streets of Ahmedabad. So once the state does that, once the state lets go of its authority or, and its a monopoly over violence, uh, it, it's difficult, especially in our part of the world where the size of the state is very small, that the per million uh, size of the police force, for instance, is quite small. Uh, and then because of that, and the fact that the state looks away when there is violence and is, and is not able to provide justice for a variety of uh, structural reasons. Mob violence will actually uh, escalate. So I don't see this going away, especially because it's the government that uh, is looking to make sure that there is mischief done in, in uh, a society. And so long as you have a government that is uh, not only willing, but enthusiastic about doing this and being rewarded for doing this, which we have to accept that the BJP is, that the BJP is getting rewarded by voters for what it has done to us. Uh, so long as this uh, continues, the state of affairs will not change. So that's a completely pessimistic outlook from Akar that it's not going to change because the BJP gets rewarded for this. Uh, Mr. Nakhvi, you have been saying from the beginning at least thrice, I think that you are optimistic, you are an optimist. Do you agree with that, that this othering uh, is not going to go away? Because there is one, uh, one line in your book which sort of stayed with me. Uh, Someone says in the book that secularism lasts while the ruling class backed it. And now the ruling class is not backing it anymore. Well, that is true. And yet, and yet it is not a shibboleth of mine 
it is my absolutely ardent belief that we are not made this way. I, the village I come from, the, the social texture of that village is still the same. You know, and I, again, I, I, I don't want to repeat things I've said so many times. When I used to wake up in the morning, you know, there's a thing called Sohar. Sohar is a song sung at childbirth. And the Sohar, my mother's favorite Sohar, and my grandmother's favorite Sohar was, Allah Mia, Hamre Bhaiya Ka Dio Nand Lal. Oh my Allah, give my brother a son like Lord Krishna. Now that was the ethos. Where is it fled? Suddenly because politicians have come and introduced this venom in, uh, between us. I don't think so. I think you, you are giving far too much. Yes, the state is there. The state is patronizing the goons and the carders. But the carders are not the people. My fear is that the people like you, out of after sympathizing for a period of time, will get bored with sympathy and you will then begin to be guilty. And that, that point when that comes will, will, will be a very decisive, it will be a critical moment when half the people I consider liberal have begun to feel guilty because they, they, they've not done anything. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, don't mean Akar. He's written a fabulous book. But, and he, in fact, is in deep trouble himself. But he, he, he's a brave man. And we need more of you, Akar. There aren't so many. We, we aren't made, uh, Mr. Nakui says, Akar, the question is to you that we are not made this way. That we are not people who react like that. Just a small personal uh, nugget I want to give you. I'm one of those people who always thought that uh, you know, whether it's my family or friends, uh, they would they would say bigoted stuff at times. But if it comes to real violence, if it comes to genocide, if it comes to people getting beaten up, they will not support it. This was the this is the uh, notion under which a lot of people live, including me. Uh, for me, the reality came when the Shabrimala temple was opened for women. On the first day when women tried to go inside the temple, a lot of women reporters, journalists had reached Shabrimala, the place called Nilakil, where uh, reporters were standing. My colleague, Sarita, my current colleague, Pooja, they were all beaten up very badly. In fact, one of them was in a hospital for almost 30 days. So when this happened, within my family groups, people said, but why did they go? They knew they will get beaten up. So then I realized that it's no longer hypothetical in my mind that when violence happens, there is a silent sanction or even a direct sanction, which a lot of them will give. So Akka, would you agree that, uh, maybe I'm too pessimistic, but would you agree that a lot of people don't think like this? that it is because the state and a lot of other elements are acting in certain ways that people are forced to also go through this. But, but elementally, we are not people like that. Well, I think that we have enough evidence to uh, and science to show us what the status of this country is at the moment. So at the very primitive level, you could look at television ratings. Why is it that the most vicious TV channels are also the most successful and the most popular? Uh, the reason is that their content is popular. We also have a slightly more sophisticated system, which is voting. That you've got a you've got a party in India that took up an issue specifically that it had not uh, the the BJP the Janasang was formed only a few months after the idols had been smuggled into the mosque, but it had not raised the issue at all till 1986, when Mr. Advani became the head of the BJP and he discovered that it was a good issue to mobilize on and. Uh, Indians agreed in large numbers. 3,000 people died. But the BJP was able to double its vote share. After 2002 and Mr. Modi coming to Delhi um, in 2014, the BJP has doubled its vote share one more time. So it has gone from single-digit votes nationally, which it had in 1990. The first state the BJP won on its own was only in 1990. They did not have a single state of their own. I mean, they were in sort of, you know, alliances. But the first state they won with a full majority came only in 1990 because of the mobilization against Muslims and that mosque. So we, uh, after you have further violence, the vote share doubles again. The last point here is that, and maybe this speaks to the pessimism or, or the optimism, that uh, unfortunately or fortunately, we've drawn a majoritarianism, which is also 
extremely incompetent at running the uh, economy, at running foreign policy, at running national security. So we are, we, are, we are very fast running out of space where purely hatred-driven top-down can be the dominant force in politics in India. How long can I absorb 100 rupee petrol and diesel? How long can I absorb 6% of inflation? How long can I look away from the fact that my army is both engaging with China, demanding a return to the status quo ante with the prime minister saying that, that, that there is no change? I'm saying that all of these things, either, either we are a total outlier, that the, we are the most, we are the only democracy in the world where none of this counts and only beating up a 14% minority counts and that is what makes me happy. Either we are that or there will be change at some point. My, my guess is that the change will come soonish, but by soonish, I don't mean 2024, I think it will take longer than that. So I have to wind up the session, but I have a last question. I don't know if the answer is going to be simple, Mr. Nakhvi. The question is from Mohammed Ayu. He disagrees with you on your theory about Nehru and why Nehru wanted to keep Kashmir. In fact, Mr. Ayu says Nehru did not advocate secularism because he wanted to keep Kashmir. It was the other way around. His commitment to secularism, he thought, would be strengthened if Kashmir remained a part of India. That was the argument. That is what I said. If Kashmir is part of India, then Kashmiris would be hostage, more or less, to a, the secular idea. If Kashmir goes away, I'll tell you, I believed in it. We were all fooled by this until 1980s, late 80s. I used to, you know what the formulation was? <clears throat> Indian secularism protects, among a billion others, the world's second largest Muslim population. And any issue, including Kashmir, should be touched, keeping that, being sensitive to that fact. Today, I feel like a fool. In fact, the whole argument has been lost because of the, in, in this present state, on what logic are we keeping Kashmir? Like Kashmir was kept by Nehru, logic was secularism because it will sustain us. We have not, we have not subscribed to the two nation theory. Yes, because of certain exigencies of the situation, we've given them Pakistan, but our secular state, Kashmir is going to be a crown jewel there. That was Nehru's idea. Now today, what has happened? On what basis are we keeping Kashmir? I've turned it around. One, sm I, uh, one small little data that might be useful. The external and the internal in India is a long debate. I can, we can have another discussion of that. But Mr. Modi went to, to Gujarat on the 7th of October 2001. 7th of October. 7th of October is precisely when the fireworks, American fireworks started in Afghanistan hunting for Osama bin Laden. So the whole global atmosphere was nothing but Islamophobia. Go back to those days. The most hated entity in the world was in that canopy 2002 February Godra happened. Did you see? People virtually didn't notice it. It was, and it was as if we had global sanction. Communalism, hating Muslims, Islamophobia had global sanction at that time. Now that sanction has disappeared. That sanction has disappeared. And we are now unto ourselves in this well called India. Is it sustainable? I don't know. Is it a cowbell phenomena? I have spelled out to you. Will Kerala take it? Will Tamil Nadu take it? Will Andhra take it? Will half of Karnataka take it? I have my doubts. And Northeast will take it? I have my doubts. So therefore, 
if it is going to be a perpetual struggle, that is the worst outcome. If it is going to be a perpetual struggle, that is the worst outcome. That is what Mr. Syed Nakwi says. Thank you very much, both of you, for uh, joining the session. To everyone, um, get the book, The Muslim Vanishes, uh, from, not from bookstores, but as of now, you have to order oh, yeah. online. Thank you very much, the Bangor International Center, for organizing uh, this talk. Leka? Um, it is always stirring to have individuals like Saeed and Akar or any program. Uh, because they speak truth to power. To listen to this conversation is to have a have a comfortive uh, defense mechanism bubbles that several of us built for ourselves, having it scratched and hammered at. Our uh, reality of increasing bigotry is worrying. Oh, Acknowledging the troubling trends in mainstream media and politics is of utmost importance. And that this conversation and many like these that we uh, constantly strive to have at our platform could be the first step to bring from that bring. And uh, maybe it's time for citizens to uh, seize the narrative and make this drawing back, back from the brink possible. Uh, thank you, Danya, as always, for your fantastic uh, moderation. Thank you, Akar and Mr. Nakhvi, uh, for uh, being here and for doing what you do. Uh, thanks, thanks to everybody uh, in the audience who joined us, and uh, see you next time. Thank you very much.